of conditions, abiotic stresses to which the ancestors of rice might have been exposed, perhaps not every year, but perhaps every few years, over millions of years, and 46 billion years is a, an estimate of the age of, of the Liza, then you can see some logic to Darwin's uh, suggestion that natural selection could probably accomplish quite a bit over 46 million years. So that's the, the basis of my first proposed principle. And uh, taken by itself, it, it may seem kind of dumb, but maybe when you see how I defined simple and trade-off, then maybe you'll find it more convincing. A simple mutation I'm defining as things that can arise by a single mutation. Uh, so I would argue, for example, that increasing the expression of an existing gene, probably in many cases there's a dozen or more different mutations that would increase the expression of uh, some, some gene for drought tolerance, for example. And uh, my definition of simple also covers improvements that require a series of steps as long as each of those steps involves an increase in fitness. Now I do have an example in the book of uh, quite a convincing example of repeated evolution where it must have passed through a lower fitness uh, intermediate. But I'm not including that in my definition of simple as, as something that's you know, bound to, to have arisen and been tested by natural selection. And then the second part, I'm only talking about trade-off free improvements things that would increase individual plant fitness under all conditions. So for example, if there's some mutation that increases drought tolerance, and every 10 or 20 years, uh, the ancestors of, of rice were exposed to drought, and that mutation increased drought tolerance, but didn't have any negative effects, didn't make them more susceptible to disease, didn't make them uh, more susceptible to flooding, those kinds of things. That would be what I would call a trade-off free uh, improvement. So if you put this, these two definitions into uh, my statement, I would claim that it's a tautology in the same way that Darwin's statement that things that have better survival and reproduction will tend to become more common uh, over time is also perhaps a tautology. In both cases, I hope there's some useful explanatory power. So that ends the, the part of the talk about the, the power of natural selection and the cases where it may be difficult for humans to improve on nature. But the, uh, the, the rest of this today and, and quite a bit of my talk will be talking about the, the opportunities for improvement. And there, there's really two uh, categories I would suggest. First, complex improvements, things that haven't been tested by natural selection. You know, we can't say whether they would be beneficial or not. We can try to reason it out. But we can't say, oh, if this were beneficial, it would already have evolved if it's sufficiently complex that it might never have, have uh, arisen in the first place. And then the other large category is the case of trade-offs that have been rejected by past natural selection, but for our purposes are perfectly acceptable. So starting with the complex improvements, here I have a fitness landscape that uh, has at the, at the left a what they call a local optimum, something where any small mutation away from that genotype is going to lower fitness, and therefore the genotype is going to tend to, the population is going to tend to keep that genotype, even though if the population somehow got to this genotype, it would have higher fitness than what it has now. But you can't get there from here. There's this valley of low fitness intermediate in between, which 
may not absolutely prevent uh, evolution from getting to the higher fitness, but certainly you can't count on it. So uh, C4 rice is a possible example of that. We know that the C4 photosynthetic pathway has evolved uh, many times. I thought it was 30-some, but apparently it's 60-some independent uh, cases of C4 photosynthesis evolving. So I don't know, you know, if 64 cases is enough, you should say it's, it's simple. But if we look at the uh, phylogenetic distribution of C4, we find uh, a number of cases in the branch of the grasses that has uh, corn and sorghum, but we don't find any in the uh, clay or branch of the grasses that has rice. So at least within the uh, rice's um, you know, near relatives, it may be that evolving C4 photosynthesis isn't that easy. Now, an alternative hypothesis could be that it's not beneficial for some reason in those um, uh, those plants, but I certainly wouldn't wouldn't uh, venture an opinion on that. My guess is it would be beneficial, in fact, though difficult. Uh, another example of photosynthetic. This is discussed photosynthetic improvement. This is discussed uh, in a, a little detail in my book. Um, but some of you may know this, this paper by Weish, if that's the correct pronunciation. Uh, very impressive work, what they did was to deal with photorespiration, where the uh, products of photorespiration are normally released as CO2 by respiration in the mitochondria, where they then you know, diffuse away into the atmosphere. And they were actually able in Arabidopsis to move this CO2 release step into the chloroplasts, where the CO2 is coming out you know, right near uh, you know, you know, a high concentration of rubisco and has an opportunity to be, be taken up. And at least in the Arabidopsis, they got a substantial increase in yield, which went away at high CO2, consistent with their hypothesis that they were, that they had come up with another solution to the problem of photorespiration, different from the C4 solution. Another example, most of my work over my career has dealt with nitrogen fixation. And I would certainly suggest that nitrogen fixing rice would be a very difficult thing, probably more difficult than, than C4 photosynthesis. But if the C4 project is a resounding success, maybe we'll be able to go back to the Gates Foundation and get money for another even more ambitious project. But sort of following uh, John Sheedy's seminar yesterday, what are we going to do while we're waiting for C4 rice? And my suggestion is that it would be useful in uh, this less ambitious breeding, I would say, to think about these trade-offs if you're not already rich. I won't assume I, I think I mentioned that my discussions here have been very, I've been very impressed by people. I've talked to so far. So what kinds of trade-offs am I talking about where natural selection might have rejected something, but we nonetheless uh, might be willing to accept it? First, trade-offs between past and present conditions. You know, we don't really care if uh, some rice cultivar is resistant to some pest that died out you know, a thousand years ago, for example. A large category of trade-offs, and this was the focus of a classic paper by Colin Donald, and uh, Rory pointed out to me yesterday, reminding me that John Harper had, had made a, uh, a similar point about trade-offs between individual fitness, which is what natural selection goes for, and the collective performance of plant communities. And then finally, this is a little bit related to that, but I think it's worth considering separately, the trade-offs between current and future benefits. Natural selection is like a, a river flowing downhill. It's not going to go flow over a mountain even though the ocean is over there. You no, know, it just responds to, to present conditions and maybe it'll end up in inland lake somewhere and, and never make it to the ocean. But certainly, 
uh, we humans, if we had an opportunity to grow a crop that was going to have substantial beneficial effects on next year's crop, that might be something we would think about, even though natural selection would not have done that. So first of all, the trade-offs between uh, current and present, or past and present conditions. We'll start with a trade-off. Uh, this is, each of these dots is a different rubisco, the key photosynthetic enzymes from a bunch of different species, and the axes are the horizontal axis is the specificity for CO2 over oxygen, greater specificity results in lower photorespiration, so that's beneficial in terms of crop growth and yield. But there's a trade-off between specificity, apparently, and reaction rate. Turnover rate of the enzyme is the vertical axis, such that if you want uh, rubisco with greater specificity and lower, lower uh, photorespiration, you're probably going to have to accept a lower reaction rate and the reason that rubisco is the most common protein in the world, uh, possibly in the universe, if this is the only planet with protein, uh, is that it has a relatively low reaction rate, and so it takes a lot of enzyme molecules to get a decent rate of photosynthesis. Given that, this seems to be the optimum for, for most of our uh, crop plants. This is about where they are on this trade-off curve. And analysis by Ju et al. suggested that this actually indicates adaptation not to present-day CO2, but this is the optimal balance for pre-industrial CO2. And apparently neither natural selection nor plant breeders have kept up with the rapid increase in atmospheric CO2 over the last hundred years or so. And if you have higher CO2, that means you, you may be willing to sacrifice a bit of CO2 specificity, you're less important than it was at lower CO2, and move a little bit up that line and get more active rubisco molecules. Here's an example that many of you may be familiar with. This is data from, from Erie. And a comparison in 1995 between the, the yield of IR8 and the more recent IR72 showed higher yield of IR72 over the whole range of nitrogen rates, which the horizontal axis. But Dr. Peng and colleagues dug up an older data for the yield of IR8 and found that back in 1968, when IR8 was young, it had higher yield than IR72 had in 1995. So there's apparently a trade-off here between current and past conditions uh, for IR8, with it being better adapted to the conditions in 1968 relative to more recent conditions. And that could be partly a function of the uh, longer time that pests have had to evolve the ability to attack higher rate, but it could also, there have been other suggestions as well having to do with, with uh, changes in soil properties and so on. Now turning to what might be really my major theme of the series of talks and of the book, idea that I stole from Colin Donald and others, the trade-off between individual plant fitness and the collective performance of plot communities. And these are just some of the traits that have been involved in, in this height, including a response to crowding signals from the red-far-red ratio, uh, leaf angle, which John talked about, uh, and solar tracking is sort of a variant on that, something I worked on. Tillery, uh, root distribution, plants that uh, invade their neighbor's space and steal some of these soil resources from under their neighbors are going to be favored by natural selection. But a whole field of those plants is going to have uh, lower yield 
and that's actually from a theoretical exam analysis by a doctor, Sean, I don't know if any of you know him. You might know somebody by that name, but I guess it's probably a fairly common name. And then I'll discuss later uh, trade-offs that involve the, the timing of photosynthesis over the course of the day. But without talking about specific traits, probably height was, was dominant here. Here's a couple of examples where scientists had mixed together higher and lower yielding genotypes, that is, genotypes which grown in isolation had higher or lower yield, and both for the barley and for the rice, uh, once again, data for Erie. It's wonderful how much, how many of the great studies of rice have been done at Erie or collaboration with Erie. I guess I shouldn't be surprised by that. In both cases, the higher yielding genotype disappeared in competition with the lower yielding genotype. And finally, the, the trade-offs between uh, past and uh, present or future conditions. Just some examples here. We might want a crop whose uh, dead leaves and stems and crop residue generally would mineralize at some particular rate that would be matched to the nitrogen demand of the next crop and it would mineralize at a rate that you know, would, would minimize uh, loss of, of nitrogen, for example. But natural selection doesn't care about that. You know, once the plant's dead, uh, that's pretty much it as far as it's, it's concerned. Uh, may not be true for rice, but for many crops, the channels that are left behind in hard soil by roots can be used by the next crop, and that lets them get uh, deeper in the soil faster and with uh, less investment of, of carbon and nitrogen and other resources. So we could certainly imagine breeding a crop that would be particularly useful in terms of their depth or their, their persistence. If you think about a, a root with sort of a network that would be uh, coarse enough that the next root could you know, get into it, but then it would hold the soil channel open or something like that. Natural selection doesn't care about that. You know, that's that's the, next, the next generation, and that next generation may have some of my descendants, but it's also going to have all their, all their uh, competitors uh, mixed in. And finally, uh, effects of this year's crop, or this, this crop and multi-crop system on the soil microbial community, whether we're talking about uh, harmful you know, soil pathogens and how this year's crop might affect the pathogens that are there next year, or uh, beneficials. So for example, we think of mycorrhizal fungi as being beneficial, and they generally are, but in at least this example from Nancy Johnson, done at the University of Minnesota long before I arrived, what she did was ask the the species of mycorrhizal fungi that increase under corn, what effect does the relative abundance of those species have on the growth of corn, and what effect does it have on, do they have on the growth of soybean? And so you can see that with these negative values here, these four species that increase under corn Actually, the more of them there are in the soil, or the larger proportion of, of the mycorrhizal community is formed by this, this population that's enriched by corn, the worse the corn grows. On the other hand, the corn is really doing a favor for the soybean by enriching the soil with species that are particularly beneficial to soybean. Now, I'm not arguing at all. I mean, she suggested that this is perhaps one of the benefits of crop rotation. I have no idea whether this particular result is general. That is, whether a given species usually shifts the balance in a way that's harmful to that species and beneficial to other species. But at least illustrates the general point that this year's crop has effects on next year's soil microbes in a way that we might be able to agree for, but that natural selection will not have optimized, at least by our criteria. 